Welcome back to Truth Talk, and we are going to talk about the truth. I have just come down to the studio from watching the live coverage of Donald J. Trump's arraignment. For the first time in U.S. history, a president, an ex-president, has been arraigned and tried, and he has not yet been convicted. He is still innocent until proven guilty, unless you ask the left, who have already incentivized his guilt and marginalized his influence. And of course, as the narrative goes, anybody who votes for him is a right-wing wacko nut. The reality is, is the man has touched a pulse in a culture. And I could say this as well for Canadians. I could say this for Pierre, or I could say this for others that are premiers in, in other parts of Canada. I can say this for uh, uh, Farage in Europe. There is something about the pulse and the indication of what these men are touching. And what that is to me is they are speaking openly. Now, in Canada, there is not the freedom of speech. There is the freedom of expression in the Charter of Bill of Rights. And that is something that is vastly different than freedom of speech. Basically, in our modern world, no matter which side of the border, no matter which country you are, you enjoy the freedom of speech, and they allow freedom of speech as long as your speech is what they like you to speak freely of. But if they don't agree with your speech then it is no longer freely accepted. And so what you're seeing is a moral zeitgeist, spirit of the age, of the time, as the noose tightens. You can see it almost everywhere. There's no industry standard. There's no industry averages or industry norms that are not showing some key indicators and barometric indicators to the economy and to the social tapestry of the world we live in. Now, I will say plainly, I look at economies, and economies, to me, must be ran by numbers, not by politics. I'm not a politician, and don't give a wit about politics. But I will tell you this, I'm extremely interested in the slide, the decadence, the decline of cultures, the moving of the foundations that these cultures are held upon. And there are some key questions that one must ask. And it's interesting to me that it is in the sports world. I am not an avid follower of sports, although I do follow sports. I don't follow the games and I don't really follow the players, but I follow it from a more of an academic and a data-driven point. And for some reason, these numbers get stuck in my head. I find it interesting that, that it indicates a kind of a barometric um, ideology. You can kind of gauge a society's mercurial ups and downs based on the sports world and the ideologies around it. So I'm going to talk and do an episode about uh, why sports are so deeply troubling as well as conflicting, but why it is important to keep your eye on the politics that are surrounding the sports world. Now, years and years and years ago, sports used to be about yardage. It used to be about stats. It used to be about batting averages, heights, slam dunks, and three points. It used to be about many things, but one thing that it wasn't about was ideology and politics. However, that has changed drastically. And the world we live in now has caved and it has become something that is a bit bizarre, to say the least. Now, we just passed through the Super Bowl. 
And not very long ago, a month ago or maybe a little more, somewhere in February was the Super Bowl. And it's now in the books. And if you read those books, it'll show you that the Kansas City Chiefs won this last Super Bowl. And the game took place in a massive stadium in Glendale, Arizona, a a suburb of Phoenix. And it was always a big deal. And the Super Bowl is something that is extremely powerful. Now, when you think about the Super Bowl, you're looking at at least to some degree how America and you could do the same thing with the World Series or the World Cup. But (laughs) much of how they view themselves is wrapped up in this. And you can see what's happening in the trends and in the zeitgeist of the day. It's estimated that over 100 million viewers watch the Super Bowl. That number would not include yours truly. I do not watch the Super Bowl. I have very little interest in it. And I am staunchly opposed to it because of its overtly sensual, devilish, sexy, and all kinds of other things I could say about its halftime shows. When you're looking at this, there are tailgate parties and Super Bowl parties and all kinds of things. And most of the time when the, when the Super Bowl rolls into a town to inhabit the venue of choice, prostitution takes on a significant spike um, as well as child sex trafficking. And so by the time that the Super Bowl came around, the week of, the cheapest ticket that one could buy was eight thousand. I'm sorry, three thousand eight hundred and sixty-three dollars. And by the end of the week, twenty-four hours within it, uh, the Super Bowl, the cheapest ticket was over eight thousand dollars. Now that's not where they make their real money. They make their real money in advertising. The big money is television, and the big money is viewership, and it's always around advertising. But not only that, it's not just the advertising. It's, it's not just that. There's significantly more going on. And, and, and let's just talk about advertising for a moment. Billions and billions and billions of dollars every year are spent on preteen teens, and they target them. Why? Because there's a certain list and litany of product one must own in order to be successful. And what I find interesting is that so much of the branding, I'm going to get into this in another episode, so much of the high-end branding and the luxury branding is no longer purchased by the elite, no longer purchased by the uber wealthy. In fact, most of Gucci is purchased by those who live under the median income. And so what you realize is you realize that advertising branding is an amazing opportunity. (coughs) Now, if one was to advertise on this year's Super Bowl, a half of a minute, a 30-second television ad would cost you $7 million. That brings in a total of $14 million per minute, some of them running up to three minutes long. That's staggering, astounding amount of money for what return? And even the New York Times, the, that very bastion of liberalism, says that it seems, Laura Kelly writes, that it is only about a flood of beer and alcohol advertisements. And thus you have an x-ray into the cultures and the values of the United States and the world we looked at. Now, no, I just don't want to pick on the sports. I also want to talk about the Grammys. Wouldn't want to miss that debacle of decency. Wouldn't want to miss that clown show by all them who have done nothing, do nothing, and will never amount to anything other than being the superhero that the couch potato isn't and can't be. 
And so some poor dupe who lays around and lets his wife watch some other man be the hero in the feet, and he, as he watches some other woman be the bastion of beauty and the epitome of elegance and femininity, all of this coalesces into a great parade of flesh and ignorance, I might add, in the Grammys every year. Now, what happened at the Grammys this year? Well, it was an orgy of devil worship and satanic occultism. The Grammy show was demonic. It seems to me that the longer we progress into the digression of society, the more the ones that have tried to hold a standard against the world and against its influences and against what Hollywood is and what the sports world is, which is the modern version of idolatry, and yet, where is the people that will rise up and say, this is awful? The Grammys this year, bluntly, I will say, in its multifaceted approach and various themes, was overtly sexual and absolutely crude in moral terms. And no one, no one could participate in that venue and in that culture and industry and claim to be a Christian. Christian and Hollywood are mutually exclusive terms. Now, when you look at this, the Grammys Awards, songs were played by people dressed as Luciferian serpent worshipers, and this orgy of demonic occultism burst forth on the scenes and screens of people's devices all over planet earth. Now, when you look at what we're facing here, we're facing more than a performance problem. We're, perf we're facing more than just that our, that our culture's choice and venue of performance and performers have now fallen into a state of decline. What we're doing here is we're seeing virtually anyone from any era of human history will recognize it for what it is, a spectacle of godlessness, antichrist, and an exaltation of the flesh. Now, what is decadence? Decadence is the ostentatious rebellion that causes a nation to collapse and decline. So one could read Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, but the decline is precipitated by actions. What are those actions? They are the spirit of that age which exalted itself in the perversions and all of the perverse behaviors of that culture. In fact, decadence is a rather long form word that really has more to do with the decline of a culture and the fact that the culture is cutting itself off from the founding principles that gave it birth. This ought to give every single person a moment of pause and say, what was our nation founded on? What were the guiding principles in which we, in a Judeo-Christian context, received a pretty ample and consistent blessing in our life? And now, as the decadence rises, the decline increases and is moved fast-paced. Why? Because decadence and decline are synonymous. It speaks not only of cultural realities, but of the moral foundations beneath that culture. It's interesting to me that as a culture begins to decline and a culture begins to, to erode, it glories in the very things that are destroying it. We just came through a period of history and time where science was touted. Science was touted as a foremost and worthwhile endeavor. That at all costs, one must wear this on one's face, or one must take the jab, or one must, one must, one must. It's the line goes on and on of the things you have to do. But boy, when it comes to the liberal and the leftist agenda of demoralizing 
the culture, through the decadence, the ostentatious rebellion, then to the ash heap of history go science. We don't care about that. We're going to do things to children. We're going to promote alcoholism to the degree that that drunk driving and, and deaths related to alcohol and liver and kidney diseases and all these things. We don't care about science when it comes to decadence. And what's interesting to me is that all this is seen in the not-so-small microcosm of how the sports world interacts and serves as a barometer for the culture that we live in. I won't be very long on this episode, but that unpacks a question, a true, honest question. To all the organizations that could not see the lane that they were called to be in, that could not be content with being loud where the Bible was loud, quiet where the Bible was quiet, but they had to integrate their systems concepts to become the worldly venue that it has become. Let's take, for instance, in the United States, which glibly and quite delusionally, I might add, deems themselves the bastion of right conservatism and Christian morals and values. But name me, hardly is there a Christian college in the U.S., at least not among the, the, the super pack of colleges, not among the major brands, that have not integrated a full-functioning sports program into their theological pursuits as well. Has anyone considered the danger that they have done to themselves by through self-inflicted wounds of worldliness and compromise with the world's demands in seeking to be a college that stands on par with other colleges? They have become exactly what they were not called to be, and now they will die? It seems to me that they're slated. It seems to me that they're coming for the, the universities that are Christian-based. It seems to me that this decadence that cuts one off from the, from the foundation that they live in, watch and see if, if it does not become illegal in time in the United States to have a quote-unquote Christian college. So much so that one of the pundits asked recently, will Christian colleges survive? Will colleges and universities that hold to historical biblical definitions of gender, sexuality, marriage, Christian, Judeo-Christian conservative values, will they be forced into an academic wilderness? What about the American collegiate sports? Will conservative Christian schools be ruled out of bounds? And he adds... And that means they're coming for your Christian school and they're coming for your Christian university as well. How do we know this? Well, because one of the great famous Christian universities in the United States of America, in our very own Tulsa, Oklahoma, the heartbeat, the breast of the American dream, Middle America, the great bastion and plains of cowboys and conservatism. Things that they sang about, manliness and virtue. And within those dusty plains by that river in Tulsa, there was a man one time named Oral Roberts who founded a university. He opens his Christian college with the idea and the mindset that he would teach those Christian values and give an alternative. Of course, these Christian schools caved and compromised and became worldly in their approach. And if we're going to be a college, then we must have organizations. We must have the power to play ball where the world plays ball. We can't just study the Bible, pray, and we can't just produce preachers and theologians and Christian-based businessmen. No, we must be everything that the world is. 
consider the article that came up in USA Today's sports section not long ago. And mind you, USA Today is like one of the most middle-of-the-road papers that you can. And the title of the article was For the Win. And I'm telling you, it's, it'll blow your mind when you read this article out of USA Today. And it is the public call of the NCAA to eliminate Christian schools because they do not match with the modern values. There's unbelievably, the headline read, Oral Roberts University isn't the feel-good March Madness story that we need, speaking of the March Madness college playoffs. The article chronicles the unexpected triumph of the men's basketball team at Oral Roberts University, the Christian University located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The team not only made its way into the NCAA tournament, but it then defeated Ohio State and the University of Florida to advance to that Sweet 16 spot. The only problem is, is that who are these guys? Who is this team? Well, they begin to say they're from Oral Roberts University, a Christian university. Now, nobody expected for the NCAA to go look at the bylaws and say, well, wait a minute, you can't be a winner and you can't play sports and have Judeo-Christian foundations. They began to call them out of date, you're bigoted, you're homophobic, you're prejudicial on views to marriage, gender, sexuality, conservatism, and biblical values. What we have here is an organization chartered for the propitiation and extension and propagation of Christian values that somewhere along the line decided we need us a team that plays in the NCAA. Sponsored tournaments. Now, the NCAA begins to look, and, and they are the people who are looking at all of these tournaments to see if they meet the criteria. And they begin, and this is fact, you can go look it up. The NCAA is systematically eliminating Christian schools from all the postseason plays and even trying to cancel their memberships in some of the tournaments. Now, why, why is that? That is because the NCAA, they said, should never have permitted Oral Roberts to participate in the national tournament in the first place due to the institution's apparently bigoted, out-of-date, homophobic, prejudicial views on marriage, gender, and sexuality. And yet the spotlight grows and they're looking at these people and they're asking themselves, is this really what we want to play with? Now, she also writes in this article, condescendingly, she lays out the school's standards of behavior, the student code of conduct, which bans profanity, social dancing, shorts in the classroom. She writes in a way that is apparently meant to just shock and all. And so she lays out their student handbook and says they do not have a right to have those institutional beliefs. And yet when she puts it down, she says in this handbook, we find a book, and I quote, riddled with bigotry. You are likely to find a similar statement of Oral Roberts University. It's, it's similar in all Christian colleges. The one that I'm attending right now probably has the same exact one. As soon as I get done recording this, I'm going back upstairs to my office and I'm going to read the student handbook. They use language beyond anything most Christians might imagine, and it keys us into how the world is organizing itself and aligning itself against the principles. So, Or Roberts is found accused of violating, quote, basic values of human decency. Basic values. 
Oh, you, you, you've now done this and you're against human rights and, and human values. But what did Oral Roberts University do? And I'm not particular. I don't know anything about the academics and I don't know anything about the faculty and the general program of Oral Roberts. So don't, please don't take it that I'm an apologist for Oral Roberts University of Tulsa. I, it, it's, it's coming to a Christian school near you. It's coming, to, it's coming to a Christian university near you. Why? Because what does this mean that they are violating basic values of human decency? What does that mean? What are they actually guilty of? Well, here it is. They adhere to biblical Christianity and believe and teach the historical concepts of judo christianity she describes the university or the school as an institution of hateful prejudice that espouses moral regressiveness and is said to fetishize chastity well since when is is chastity a, a fetish it's it's emotionally healthy number 1 there's stacks and stacks okay let me not go into the stacks and stacks first. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? That's what they're mad about. Thou shalt not have illicit sexual intercourse. And they say, what does a God care about what I do in my bed? Because he's God. He can care about what you do anywhere. And a sovereign God has the sovereign right to tell me what to do wherever and whenever I am. Okay? So... Don't put, so don't put it all on God, thou shalt not commit adultery. Let's talk about the reverse. Let's, let's change that. Thou shalt not have a divorce. Thou shalt not break the trust of your wife. Thou shalt not break up your home. Thou shalt not destroy your finances by splitting everything in half with your wife and both of you with half of what you need. Go away and attempt to ascribe to a life that's going to be fully built on half of what you need. You don't have to go through that. And you don't have to break your kid's heart. And you don't have to sit down with your legal counsel and ask your children, who do you want to live with? Do you like mom or do you like dad? Who do you want to visit this weekend? Look at all of that. They don't talk about that. And there are stacks and stacks and stacks of peer-reviewed journals that say that divorce is, is a psychologically um, painful thing to go through and children bear the brunt of it. But it's bigotry but it's homophobic, but it fetishizes chastity. This is her way of dismissing the requirements that students restrict sex to marriage between a man and a woman after they are married. And yet, that's just good, healthy life practices. It's proven. Multiple Partners in a sexual relationship increases the potential not only for the emotional and psychological damage, but also for the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases. And so here's what you have to realize. You're watching the sports world be the spearhead to this divisiveness that's cutting and dividing between the, the foundations that the country or institutions are built on. Make no mistake about this, guys. It may be that university in Tulsa today, but tomorrow it may be the one you go to. It may be Oral Roberts University in Tulsa today, but tomorrow it could be Wilson University in, in Sacramento, California, or William Jessup, or Hope University, or any of the rest of them. Why? Because they are coming for anybody that does not bow to their idolatry. You can count on it. And you say, well, th this is a lot of scare words, and it seems like it's, it's, it's politically motivated. No, I have a right to speak, and when they call my obedience to Jesus Christ bigotry and phobia and regressive sexist policy, I'm offended by that, and I am allowed to express my offense. 
I'm not expressing hatred towards anybody. I'm expressing my offense and my integrity and desire to keep institutions that are based on a Judeo principle. But if you go to New York, Atlanta, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or Seattle, any any institution that is Islamic, they have the same student handbooks. But it isn't it amazing? They won't say anything about that. Go to any synagogue, and they will have a very close version of a moral code and standard and ethics. But of course, you can't touch that. Not that I think any of them things should be touched. I think we should have freedom to speak, to defend, and ultimately, we should prepare our hearts and minds and be willing to die for the perseverance of the gospel. And the perseverance of the gospel is what I'm talking about. Because if the perseverance of the gospel and of the faith is not allowed to make its way into the conversations in our world, then we are in a horrible bit of trouble. So I'm telling you, stand your ground, pray for your nation, wherever and whoever that is, but be faithful even unto death because you are not wrong for believing in the Word of God.